Wonderful. Well, thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us here tonight. Uh, very excited for the Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England. Join food and drink writer Corinne Hirsch for a virtual talk and tasting of colonial era beverages, both spiked and non-alcoholic. Uh, Corinne, who's the author of Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England, from flips and rattle skulls to switchel and spruce beer, she's going to explore the roots and reasons behind Americans' enthusiasm for drink. She'll also break down the building blocks of a rudimentary colonial era bar and touch on key events where alcohol played a role. Segwaying from the 1700s to present day, she'll also touch on her adventures as a food critic in New England and on Long Island, where she's part of the busy food team at Newsday. Uh, and she'll also discuss uh, current events in terms of uh, COVID and how it's affecting the restaurant industry and the, the food critic industry. Uh, and again, uh, tonight's program is sponsored by the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library. So all 30 of us that are here live uh, virtually on Zoom, and I'm sure Corinne, the hundreds that are gonna be watching on demand on YouTube, <laughs> let's give a big virtual round of applause to Corinne for joining us here tonight. And Corinne, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Hi, thank you so much, Robert. I'm very uh, happy to be here. Do you all see my slide right now? Do you see a skeleton or do you see me? So I'm oh, oh, we're good. <laughs> Okay, um, so I, yeah, I'm thrilled to be talking about this. I've done this presentation uh, several times in person since uh, my book came out. I'm gonna stop sharing and just talk to you. Um, and uh, my book, this is my book, Forgotten Cocktails of, Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England. It came out in uh, about four years ago now or five years ago, and I have, spoken on the subject in person quite a bit, but only twice. This is the second time virtually on Zoom. So I might be a little rusty or, no, or just uh, kind of awkward in transitions, but hopefully you'll bear with me. And I, I took a look at the schedule for the library. There are so many great events. Um, this library has a really robust program. So I'm really happy to be part of it. I saw that James Patterson is here in a week, I think, uh, in a book discussion. Um, can, you, can you believe it, Corinne? We got James <laughs> Patterson. Yeah, it's I'm so about... sick of James Patterson. Oh, that's all I've been hearing about for two weeks, Corinne. I want to oh, hear really? from you. Yes. It was, it's really exciting. Yes. Um, and I guess his book that he, he just had a new book come out yesterday or today in tandem with John Lennon's uh, the 40th anniversary of his death. So um, yeah, I might be tuning back in for that. But I, I'm happy to be with you all here. I see that you're mostly from Tewksbury. There's one from New Jersey. I'm coming at you from Long Island, where I live now. Used to live up in Vermont uh, and from New Hampshire for a number of years. So and that's that's where I was when I wrote this book. It was sort of a dive into New England history. And I hope to return at some point. But right now I'm I'm uh, covering food on Long Island for Newsday, which is a newspaper here. It's a very vibrant place to cover food, even given the constraints of 2020 and um, the moment that we find ourselves in. So um, without Going into that too much, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end if you'd like. Um, feel free to ask me some questions. I'm checking out the chat as I talk, so I'll try to toggle between them. If I miss anything, um, maybe just ask again at the end or you know, raise your virtual hand and I'll get back to it. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. And we had a little bit of a glitch with a full screen. So you're gonna see all my menus around here and hopefully it's not too distracting, but um, Here's, this uh, skeleton is from a pirate flag from the 1700s. I think it's from Blackbeard's flag. It's the one half of Blackbeard's flag. And I thought it was fitting for uh, this presentation. It's um, fits in with the era. And I'm already having a first technical difficulty. Here we go. <laughs> so when I wrote the book, uh, when I wrote uh, Forgotten Drinks of Colonial New England, I was a food writer in Vermont. I was doing what I do now up in Vermont for a publication called Seven Days in Burlington and a small press, they were called the History Press at the time, they've since been uh, subsumed into Arcadia Press. They reached out to see if I wanted to write about a book about Vermont beverages. Drinks were my niche. I wrote about food and restaurants, but I also took an interest in drinks of all kinds, not just alcohol, although Vermont was undergoing a brewing and still is a craft brewing um, resurgence at that time distilling, there were distilleries opening up all over the place. And it seemed like an interesting opportunity to, to delve into the historic roots of, of that world and understand 
kind of the long arc of history with regards to the moment we found ourselves in in 2012, 2013. So I, I proposed expanding that focus to all of New England, not just Vermont. And that's how this book came about. I wrote it in a fairly, uh, maybe about six months. Um, it's a pretty slim volume, but I packed a lot in there. I did research in historical societies and libraries, um, old volumes and um, town histories were quite a valuable source of, of, um, of information. And this is, a, this is a print that I was fascinated with as, as a kid in a book I had on pirates. Pirates was a, an early historical interest of mine. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. It's Jim Lane by William Hogarth. And it depicts a, a London street scene in the mid 1700s. And there's so much going on. It's, I could stare at it for an hour and still find new things. And I was just, you know, I thought it was just a surreal, well, it is a surreal take on what was going on then, but Jin was ravaging um, the working classes of London at the time. And this was meant as a uh, social commentary on what might happen if you sort of yield to, to Jin, this evil liquor, and there's a baby toppling over a rail and people selling their possessions and drinking and gnawing on a bone with their dog. And it just seemed horrible. It was, it was also meant as an illustration of why people might choose a life of crime or a life of piracy. What I didn't know when I was young is that there was an attendant print to it. I didn't find this until years later, the young adult. Beer Street, which was at, from the same time. So another street scene, but it's, it's harmonious and there's people hugging each other and, um, and painting and being creative. And, and, and the subtext was beer was something that you could drink and be perfectly healthy and functional and happy as opposed to gin. And that was in keeping with um, beer's role in, in culture and society and day-to-day -day life at the time. People drank beer every day and some drank it throughout the day instead of water because water um, could make you sick. There are the um, mechanisms of how water made you sick and sewage seeping into water was not well understood at that time. Fermented beverages seemed safer and fermented beverages were, were um, a very entrenched part of what you might consume in a day. And that was a habit that was brought over very early into the colonies. Um, the Virginia colony was founded in 1607 and there was beer there almost immediately. Um, it was part of the daily table for those who came from England, I think other parts of Europe. So it wasn't un unusual at all to, to drink beer um, in the morning, of course, in the afternoon and the evening. And on the Mayflower, um, famously, some people joke that the Mayflower kind of dropped anchor or stopped where it did in 1620 because they were running out of beer. And that is somewhat historically accurate. There are diary, um, I think there's some diary entries about how there was tension on board as the beer stores went down. I think, I believe the Mayflower left England later than it expected, than expected. Some of the food and the drink on board sort of were lower than expected when, um, after they crossed the ocean and um, Christopher Jones, the captain wanted to keep enough beer to get his, his crew back to England with enough to drink. And, um, when some, of the, when some of those on board came onto shore, they found coarse water that was so incredibly clean that they waxed poetic about it um, in their diaries that the water here was just uh, kind of a marvel. But beer drinking, they had been drinking beer on board. It was, it was seemed to provide nutrition as well. Um, so I haven't been keeping up for the, with the comments, but. Yeah, water. Yeah, water may have spoiled during the long voyage. That's that's true. But I think water was always seen with some suspicion at that time because it could make you sick on board, on on land or on a ship. Um, cholera was something that was recurrent. Uh, the those in the Plymouth Colony they planted barley the first summer, the first growing season that they had. Uh, I don't know how much you know about brewing, but you need a grain. Uh, malted grain and water, of course, and then a bittering agent and some flavor, flavoring. Um, barley is usually that grain or it was most prevalent. 
back then. Unfortunately, barley didn't take too well to the sort of more extreme climate of New England. Um, there were some challenges there. Also, you need specific, you need equipment for malting and for brewing. And beer brewing is, you know, it has a lot of steps to it and it wasn't, it didn't go so well. So in the beginning, people were brewing and they were malting, but uh, colonial beer got a pretty iffy reputation from the get-go because uh, when, with barley not, with grain growing not as successful off the bat, colonists were using things like pumpkin or persimmons, um, different things they found here to make beer. And the reputation of colonial beer, some of the, um, some there be Europeans who come over for tours and just sort of scoff at the beer that they found here um, in their accounts of traveling in the new world. Um, but it was, uh, it was the early, I see it as the earliest alcohol that colonists were drinking here. There is some, I, I found some sporadic documentation of a corn liquor that was shared um, with the Native Americans of the area and those who came over from Europe, which is interesting. But it seems that liquor among Native Americans was much more prevalent the further south you went, especially into the Southwest, into Mexico and Central America, different corn-based uh, fermented drinks and agave in the Southwest and not as much in New England. Um, Harvard, when it was founded, had a brewery from pretty much from the get-go. I think it was founded in 1636. It had a brewery as of the late 1630s. Harvard students were given beer to drink with their breakfast at 5 a.m. or 5.30, whenever they got up. They'd have a breakfast of beer and bread and um, were consuming quite a bit of beer because that the, the volume was, <laughs> was recorded from year to year. It seems like a lot of things were recorded when it came to alcohol um, for hundreds of years. Um, and I'll get more into that as we talk about pubs. Um, there were grapes growing everywhere here. And that excited those from England particularly because they felt that this was their opportunity to finally have a wine industry in the new world. And so very early, really, very early on in the Virginia colony and in parts of New England, vineyards were being, were being planted. French winemakers were being brought over to advise on how to, how to produce wine here. And it, it was somewhat the same ball of wax as barley and grain growing. The, the grapes that were growing here were not the vitis vinifera that you might find in French vineyards. Instead, they, this is muscadine that you're looking at. I think it's a bit of Wonderfilia, I think that's the Latin name. Not exactly the kind of grape that's going to make the wines that people were used to at that time or, or those of, of a class who could afford wine were used to. So those early experiments or stabs at winemaking just failed over and over again. There's a particular account of, I mean, going out of the geographic range that I looked at, in Florida, I think there was a French colony somewhere in Florida where they tried to grow wine to the, or tried to make wine to the um, exclusion really of feeding themselves. And, and someone happened upon them the next, the next year and the colony was practically starving to death. But they had figured wine was such an important thing to, to, to produce. <laughs> it's funny, I, I'm enjoying some of these comments. Um, and you'll see mandates for, for planting vineyards in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Maryland in the 1600s to get a wine industry going, but it really wouldn't get going until the mid 1800s. Um, there was a guy in Ohio who had sort of an accidental uh, spontaneous fermentation in a bottle and he started making sparkling Catawba and the modern winemaking industry went on from there, but it was stopped, it was touch and go for many years. Um, well, there was a wine that was pretty widespread here, and of course there was imported wine from Europe for those who can afford it. But this is the island of Madeira. This is an old depiction of the island of Madeira, off of Portugal. Um, there was a wine made there from Malvasia grapes mostly, and it was exported. Um, it, it was like exported here and there, and the story goes that a a, a, bottle, a, a cask of this white wine from Madeira was accidentally left in the in the hold of a ship, made it all the way around the world, came back, was found on board, they busted it open and found that instead of it spoiling and all of that roiling and that heat, that it had become caramelized and kind of rich and this delicious thing that then was starting to be then uh, was replicated as Madeira wine. Wine, it was aged 
by leaving it on ships and it was called the wine of the round roots. And then of course, they, uh, people who were producing it figured out how to make it without putting it on a ship to age. But it was um, very well loved in the colonies. Um, Benjamin Franklin loved Madeira. Thomas Jefferson drank it regularly. There were Madeira parties. Philadelphia was an epicenter of Madeira drinking and there was a whole ritual to drinking it. There's a really funny account of Ben Franklin sort of finding these dead flies and he drops Madeira onto them and says that they started to move their legs and then they flew away. He just thought it was this miraculous, miraculous alcohol. Um, we don't really, it's still around of course, but the drinking of it certainly died out. It did have an interesting role in, as we, as we, I know I'm jumping around a little bit in time, I'm, I'm trying to move sequentially through the, the alcohols that people were drinking. Um, Madeira has a continuity from the early 1700s through to the Revolutionary War, which is when I pretty much stopped the timeline in my, in my book. But um, as we got closer to war and as there was more tension between the colonies and, the, and Britain or England, um, Madeira was seen as kind of a democratic drink because it is it's somehow, in the way that it was sourced, it never went, I think it never went back to England or the way it was, it, you were able to get it into the colonies, it, it escaped taxation by the British. So it was even more attractive to those who were sort of always railing against the crown. Um, so we had a lot of beer drinking early on and, and continuously. Um, that was sort of taken over by the German, by those who made German lager in the 1800s, but beer was, colonial beer, as I mentioned, was um, of questionable quality here and there. What did really take off and became even more a part of daily life was cider from apples, hard cider from apples. As opposed to barley or grain, apples grew extremely well in New England. Um, there were orchards, um, you know, an orchard takes a few years to mature, but not too many years. And there were orchards by the late 1600s. And cider, cider making takes, and I, I hope, I don't know if I have many cider makers here, and, and those of you who are listening, I don't mean to insult any, but it can be a lot simpler than brewing beer. Um, you can press apples basically and let them ferment. I mean, it's better to control that process a little bit, but you could preserve an apple harvest by turning it into cider. You can preserve it for the winter. If you had just a boatload of apples in the fall, um, communities would put, put away thousands of gallons of cider to drink through the winter. Um, families would drink it. It would be, it was very much a part of the table. And children would drink a lower alcohol form of cider called cider can. It still had some alcohol in it, but it was generally from the second pressing of apples. Um, so I see it in a way as the kind of the first American, I mean, not Native American, but colonial American drink that was sort of owned by them in a way and mastered. And um, those same Frenchmen who would come over and do tours of the, of the colonies and sort of, you know, write scathing things about the beer, conversely, were in love with the cider. You'll find rapturous sort of words and about cider, about American cider. And if any of you, I don't know, how many of you drink cider in your lives, hard cider, but when it's good, it's just, it's really just so delicious. And you can get these versions that are almost like champagne. Um, I know that Massachusetts has a very um, robust cider industry. I, it did die off, of course, from the late 1800s or the mid 1800s through to very recently, there wasn't cider making. And part of that is due to the temperance movement and prohibition. Unfortunately for us, it has come back. Um, I don't know how, I think I accidentally rotated this photo when I was working on this document, but it's just a shot of um, molasses. Close up of molasses, a um, glamour shot, um, which is the basis, which was the earliest base for rum. Now molasses was a byproduct of sugar production in the Caribbean. Uh, it was seen as industrial waste of a sort uh, for a while. Um, during in the earliest days of sugar production in the Caribbean, it would be thrown into the ocean or it would be buried until someone figured out that, or I'm sure many people figured out that you could use it. It's a sugar, you can ferment it and you can distill it into alcohol, which is what started to, begin to happen. 
by the late 1600s. So the, the molasses, you can make rum from a number of things, but molasses was, um, well, not a number of things, you need something really sweet and sugary, but molasses formed the base for rum, which was called rum bullion at first. Um, and Barbados was, a, was an epicenter of rum production. Um, that rum comes clear off of the still. When you, when you put it in a barrel and transport it to New England, as was happening, New England was trading lumber and fish for uh, molasses and rum, and, and then as we progress for other things. But when you, when you transport rum, it gets sort of like Madeira, it gets those uh, caramelization and that color from the, and flavors from the barrel. So uh, Caribbean rum was much sought after, but of course, uh, colonists wanted to make their own rum. And I believe the first distillery in New York was in New York in 1664, and then one followed in Boston in 1667. And Medford, in particular, in Massachusetts, became an epicenter of rum production, um, as did Rhode Island, of course. Rhode Island uh, became quite well known for rum, but there were Massachusetts, there were hundreds of distilleries by the 1730s, and it was something that built New England's wealth. Um, but of course, uh, sugar production is built was built on backs of slave labor. It was built on slave labor, um, so rum is is inextricably linked with the slave trade, and I think we all learned about triangular trade. Um, how people were enslaved on the coast of West Africa and brought to the Caribbean. Then the resultant molasses and rum was brought to New England and the molasses was distilled into more rum, which was then brought back to West Africa and used as currency um, for people to bring more people um, to the Caribbean. So you know, New England's, I think, I'm thinking about slavery in the South and how it wasn't as prevalent in the North and New England's wealth was very much linked with slavery as well. Um, and in, in reading accounts of rum from that time, um, it seems Caribbean rum was much more coveted than New England's rum, but rum production here was very robust. And as again, as we move towards the war, there were, uh, things such as the Molasses Act in 1733 that sought to tax molasses because the colonies preferred French molasses from French islands um, and not, not British held islands. And so Britain was trying to discourage that um, smuggling rose in New England at that time, smuggling in of molasses. John Hancock was involved in that and there was an affair with um, his ship. And, and I, these details used to be very um, front and center of my mind. And if any of you are historians and find any, you want to comment or um, lend some, or I get a, a factor figure on, please let me know. But um, molasses, the kind of the taxation and attempted break in molasses trade caused quite a lot of uh, consternation and was one of the threads leading up to war. Oh, far from the tree to go back to cider. Far from the tree in Salem makes amazing hard ciders. I don't know about them, so I'd love to seek them out. Um, let's see. Um, where all of these alcohols were imbibed, <laughs> were at home, cider and beer and bitters, and in public houses, which began to open really early. Um, if you think about uh, the time elapsed from the Mayflower coming over or even Virginia, the Virginia colony to first public houses open, it's incredibly short. So people wanted places to drink, but they weren't just places to drink. They were also public houses. The earliest public houses were um, places to share news, to um, know to do transactions, um, lawmaking would be done there, games would be played. Uh, they weren't, generally weren't open throughout the day. Um, they were highly regulated. There were a lot of laws connected to, it's funny, there were laws that mandated them in new settlements. You see those in Connecticut and Massachusetts and 
Rhode Island saying you needed to have, to had a new settlement, you had to have a public house usually and a meeting house. And they were near each other, which is funny um, because they were such an important center of uh, social interaction and legal interaction for men. Women were generally not, uh, and slaves and servants were not allowed in the, in the tap room, but they did serve important roles in the building and the shaping of community. Um, this, is, uh, this is the Green Dragon Tavern, which um, sort of becomes a main character right before the, the revolution, but had opened in the mid 1600s. Um, the first public house, I believe, was Samuel Cole's, and there's some dispute about that. It seems that 1632, 1633 was the time when public houses began to open in Boston. And I mentioned that because you're so close to Boston. Um, there were public houses at uh, ferry terminuses. No, what's the plural ferry terminal? Ferry terminals. Um, what both part, both sides of a ferry. Uh, that would be a place where public houses might open or inns might open. Um, also along roads that sort of led out in spokes from the major cities. There would be inns that would spring up along those. If you have any questions, please shoot them at me. I don't see any questions, but um, it's, it's very unusual to be doing it in this format because it's quiet and usually I'm in a room where I can Corinne, don't <laughs> panic. Uh, the regulars are used to asking their questions at the very end. Okay. So don't worry too much about that. It's just such a different dynamic than in person. I mean, but everyone's been dealing with it this year, right? Just teachers and um, everyone who used to meet in person. So, um, this is the, I think this is the White's, this is a tavern in Connecticut. And I have this slide here because it shows you, I mean, it's a, a, a colonial era home. Is that a salt pot? Would that be a salt box? Um, not great with architectural terms. So basically, uh, taverns were often in these houses where you would go to one, if you walk in the front door, you go to one side, and that would be the tap room, the place where you would drink. And then the other side may be a place where women could go and and hang out with each other while, while their husbands or other male relatives were drinking in the tap room or just talking with each other, reading the news. Um, upstairs, there might be more private spaces or there might be spaces for events that you might that you could have. Uh, here's the tap room from Hall Tavern. This is in Deerfield, Mass. Historic Deerfield, it didn't uh, start there though. I believe the tavern was moved from Shalmont, Massachusetts to Deerfield at some point. But I love that I, you can go here and it's wonderful to go there in person if you're a history buff, but it gives you the feel of what a tap room was like. If you see above the bar in the corner, it's just a tiny bar. There are, and I think living in Massachusetts, you've probably all seen these. If you've gone into clubs, they still have them in some. Um, they're not so common in New York at all, but those, those, those prison-like, spikes that go down at the end of service um, to the bar because the time that you could serve alcohol was regimented um, by law. Who could open a, ta a tavern? Usually the licensee was chosen as some reputable person of the community. Um, the time that you could drink would be a specific time that was very English. I've worked in, I've been a barmaid in England and that time is still regimented. You shout at people at the end before you have to have a hard close at 10.30 or 11, or 11 o'clock or 11.30. But so you have those bars that would go down. Um, did women drink beer? So I'm guessing they did at home. And historically women have been the brute because of their the domestic duties they've taken on for uh, both in Britain and other parts of Europe and here. They were often brewers, especially going back through English history women were the brewers of the home. So I am i didn't study so much on the home front for this book and I do regret that. I wish I had included more than that. I kind of focus more on public houses, um, but they were not in tap rooms unless the licensee died. The, license, the original licensees were usually men and because of the short life expectancy, uh, people were you know, often dying in their, or passing away in their forties or fifties, widows would become uh, of the licensees. You did have widows who were running pubs. There, there's a lot of um, evidence of that. Um, I assume that women drink beer at home. <laughs> did taverns have happy hours? I, not, the, not that I've found. I mean, no, not back then. I think 
the, t the time of drinking was so short that it was just one long happy hour. <laughs> um, and I imagine people had deals. I didn't see anything about discounts though. And, and taverns did keep quite um, detailed ledgers at that time of what they had in stock or what they had in their stores and what they served often. And sometimes people ran up tabs. So you'd have ledgers, you'd have a person's tab and you could see what they were drinking. And the, the prices always seemed pretty consistent for, for items. Um, so in, in, this, in this tavern, I was about to call it a bar, um, you would have beer. Um, sometimes beer, the beer would be served in a cask with sort of a siphon at the bottom. You'd have uh, jugs of cider or barrels of cider and rum. And, and there was that stratification, but there was that, um, you know, that view that rum was less, well, I have to hurry up, I'm only halfway through and we're at 736, but it was that rum was seen as a very corruptive influence, much the way that gin was in the mid 1700s. And, and so the less reputable places to drink would be grog shops, um, grog being a mix of, of rum and water and um, in, uh, certain men of uh, lawmakers and judges uh, would write um, quite strong words against the drinking of rum. And yet beer and wine were seen as um, quite respectable to drink. But you would have those all in a public house generally, as well as Madeira in more in the cities and wine more in the cities as well. Um, this, is the ta this is a tavern, another tavern room view from Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, if you've never been, it's a fantastic place and you can wander the whole day. But it shows you the sort of the dominance of a hearth in a tap room, as it did in many colonial houses, but cooking around the hearth. And if there was uh, a woman of the house, she might often have a tavern fair, fair things that people could eat, um, corn pudding and Johnny cakes and whatnot. Was the alcohol levels in beer and cider comparable to today? Well, no. Beer was, well, beer was rated at three strengths, and those were often indicated on the, the cask with three uh, X's. So there'd be one X for a weaker beer, small beer, it was called, two X's for a uh, next step up, and three X's for a triple strength beer. Um, people were drinking what we might call today sessionable beer, it was more common, I'd say maybe around 3% alcohol, 4%, um, and sometimes le lesser than that. Whereas today's, we generally expect a beer is gonna be about five, I think it's sometimes four, but the beer was weaker. Um, but one thing I, I should go back, I've seen so many different figures on how, many, how much people drank back then. I use a figure in the book. I have had debates with people about this and I've seen different figures all over the place. People drank, uh, I should say men, because it was, the measure was among men. Men over the age of 15 by the time of the war were seen, were reputedly drinking um, the equivalent of about seven shots a day. And I've seen that figure um, varied from like four to seven gallons of pure alcohol a year. Basically, it was a lot. And that's what began to give rise to the temperance movement after the war, because that drinking started to reach a crescendo after the war was over and into the early 1800s. And then temperance, um, the forces of temperance took hold because it was causing chaos um, on the home front. And then there were other um, negative effects from it. This is also the Strawberry Bank Museum game. This might show a table where you might read a newspaper, catch up on the news, uh, play games. Those are flip mugs and I'll get into flip in a second. Write letters, do transactions. Um, Although the earliest furniture inside public houses was generally benches where people would sit shoulder to shoulder, and then that evolved into chairs and tables. I feel like I'm getting so wonky, but hopefully you guys find this interesting. You can get so geeky talking about all these small elements of the pub. Um, I think I got all the questions so far. These are some, oh, these are some early um, pub, public house signs. And gosh, if you delve into public house signs from the time and you're into uh, design and art, it's just a rabbit hole you can fall, fall down. They're just so interesting and so much different imagery on them. There was a, just, when I lived up in New Hampshire, the, the museum in Hanover at Dartmouth had a, um, an exhibit of signs and it was fascinating. 
Um, now, where, how were these drinks mixed? Um, right, they were mixed in a variety of ways. You have the crude elements I've talked about, rum, beer, cider, um, plus the addition of spices and citrus. Gave rise, from those very basic building blocks, people were endlessly imaginative. They, they created so many different drinks with really, really consonant names. Um, well, this is a punch bowl. This is a punch with, looks like some egg whites in it. And um, I acquired this photo a while ago, so I don't remember the exact components, but punch, you've probably heard of punch in relation, in, in tandem with colonial era drinking. Generally, it was a blend of rum uh, with spices and citrus, and you might add wine to it as well, um, and then serve from a bowl. There's, this is a modern punch, this is not a colonial punch, but um, on occasion that punch would be sipped from person to person, the bowl would be passed, which is something quite makes you shudder in the year 2020 when we're all being so careful to think everyone was drinking from the same punch bowl. Um, although there is still, there is still, I think there's still something to that in distilling circles. When I've covered distilling, Sometimes you'll go to a distillery, and I don't think that would happen now, but a few years ago, someone pulls something off the still and you're tasting it. I've been in, in environments where people will all drink from the same glass. Um, it's just sort of like a strange custom, but punch bowls, you know, they did kind of, they, they reinforced this idea of we're together, we're all, we're all drinking the same thing. And um, it was, there are endless recipes for punch from that time. Um, this is a rattle skull. This is a blend of dark beer, porter. It has rum in it and lime. This is a picture that I took, um, kind of a real close up. But it's just from those basic building blocks, rum, um, beer, and lime. It's really delicious. It's strong. You don't really want to have more than one. You might, or you could, but <laughs> you might fall over. Um, so rattle skull was another drink. This is a close up again. Uh, it looks like the punch, but this is actually syllabo, um, which is a blend of wine and citrus and egg whites. And it's, a it's, it's evolved over time to be a dessert. Um, I've seen syllabo as a dessert in certain, in certain family recipes and whatnot, but it was kind of a festive drink that people might have at uh, weddings or working on a house or other events, other celebrations, you'd make a big bowl of it. So sort of akin to punch, but, but different, not as strong. Um, that's nutmeg shade on top. Nutmeg was a huge part of many colonial era drinks if, they, if you could get your hands on it. Sometimes people kept their nutmeg in a little box that they traveled with. They could present it to whoever was making their drink. They would shave nutmeg over it and give the nutmeg, nutmeg back. It was quite valuable. Um, definitely a key flavor and drinking back in the 1700s. This is a stone fence, which is a blend. They wouldn't have really done a, a, a lemon twist. Maybe someone did, but that's again, my picture. Um, this is from the book. This is a blend of hard cider and rum, that's it. And incredibly simple, really refreshing and delicious. Uh, if you use good rum and you use good hard cider. It was a favorite of Ethan Allen of the Green Mountain Boys up in Vermont and um, it's documented that the Green, well, I don't know if it's heavily documented, but I think it's well known that the Green Mountain Boys were drinking stone fences, not, their, their hangout was the Catamount Tavern in Bennington, Vermont, which is in the southwest corner of Vermont. But they were hanging out in another pub in Castleton, Vermont, the night before sacking Fort Ticonderoga, and um, that stone fence was their preferred drink. Unfortunately, they found, I think they found a sleeping guard at Ticonderoga because I don't think they, I think they were worse for wear that next day. Um, this is the, the most fascinating drink of the time, which is a flip, again, modern photo that I took. Uh, flip, sort of a precursor to eggnog. Um, yeah, yeah, I should label these for the next presentation. So that's a good, that's a good uh, recommendation, thank you. Um, a flip is a blend of beer, rum, eggs, uh, cream, and spices, and sometimes in, at presentations in person, I've made them so you can see how they're made. Some ingredients are put in one pitcher, others, and then the eggs and the spices are put in another, and you pour the drink back and forth between the two pitchers, and it mixes really quickly. And it gets a, it, 
become silky. And these are raw eggs, of course. Like cooked eggs would be disgusting. <laughs> but um, you blend it back and forth. It, it makes this very silky drink, very, very hard to drink. And if you find it on tavern menus back then, you generally cost quite a bit. It would be, I've seen it on ledgers where it costs just as much as sleeping overnight in an inn because the flip was so dear in terms of its ingredients and how much effort went into it. Now it gets its name from the poker that you put in a fire, which was called a flip dog. And um, you'd stick the poker into the drink and it would, it would, it sears and char and burbles and the smoke comes off of it. And then it gets this amazing charred flavor. It's really delicious. Um, don't knock until you try it. Uh, wish I could make you one right now, but they're very good. Paul Revere, riding north from Boston, April 18th, I think, 1775, is that right? Um, he was you know, riding north to tell people that the regulars were coming, that the British were coming north. And he rode into um, Lexington um, at 2 a.m. that night. Now, this is the Buckman Tavern there. It's still there. You cannot take pictures inside, which I argued and well, I sort of tried and tried, but they wouldn't let me. But you can still go in and see the tavern in Buckman. You can still see the tap room there. So that night, there were uh, militiamen drinking here. Uh, they were drinking flip. And this tavern was known for its flip. And it was one of several public houses in town at that time. I think they went home at about 10 or 11. I don't remember the exact timeline, but Paul Revere came into town, announced, you know, told them what he needed to tell them. They went back to the tavern. Um, I think flip was still flowing. Then uh, I think the British did not arrive for a while and everyone kind of melted home except for a few people. And then of course there was the messy battle of Lexington at about 5 a.m. that morning. The, the, the door of this is still dented from a cannonball, I believe, or from some sort of something that hit it. But those who took part in that battle had certainly many, about 50 had been drinking in this, in this public house the night before. Um, that's a historical depiction of that battle. Um, this this I, ha, slide I have up here, this is a punch bowl. And I think this is from, oh gosh, what's that? There's another museum in Massachusetts, a rural one, and the name escaping me. But you see that long slender pipe on the table. So the smoking of pipes was another quite widespread activity in public houses. Smoke these long slender pipes. And you sometimes see those holes next to colonial hearts where you could put the spent pipes in and people would just dump them into the wall. Um, but I love this depiction of the punch bowl and the pipe. Um, one drink I haven't mentioned that's not alcoholic. This is uh, a print of haying, uh, haying in August somewhere in New England. I think it's Vermont. But there was a drink that uh, made from vinegar uh, and maple and water and spices, very, uh, very prevalent in Vermont in the 1700s and probably a few other parts of New England. It's really refreshing. It's not alcoholic, but the vinegar gives it so this sharp, this refreshing raciness. And um, there have been some modern creators of Switchel. Um, this was a company that launched a new Switchel in Vermont a few years ago. But it, um, with citrus could be a common component of drinks, lemon and lime. But sometimes that didn't make it into the interior of New England. And so people would use vinegar instead. They had lots of fruit to draw on. And I have not mentioned that there are a lot of isolated cases of what people made wine from everything. They just didn't need grapes. They made dandelion wine, blackberry wine, uh, wine from all kinds of berries, and of course, vinegar from that fruit as well, which you could drink, it's drinking vinegar. Um, George Washington brewed beer. Um, he made his recipe for small beer, the less alcohol -like beer that I mentioned is, uh, still kicks around his wife's uh, recipe for punch. You can still find Martha Washington's punch online. So they were quite, um, the founding fathers, they all loved their alcohol in various ways. John Adams used to start his day with a tankard of cider every day. Thomas Jefferson loved Madeira as did Benjamin Franklin. Um, and Thomas Jefferson, of course, he grew a love for wine and um, I think got a lot of his compatriots into wine. As after the war, Washington started distilling whiskey and I think himself, he hired people to do it or he had people do it for him, but he was quite involved in alcohol production. And this is a print of, I know I'm racing through, but I, like the times escaped me. 
Um, after the Revolutionary War, the Whiskey Rebellion was one of the first, I think the first crises of Washington's presidency, and this is depicting him kind of going out to Pennsylvania to deal with that. But there was such an interruption in the rum trade during the war that um, American or colonists turned to domestic sources, uh, grain and things that they could distill. And that, that was the rise of whiskey because corn grew so well here and whiskey began having its moment in the 1700s. And there were, in the late 1700s, I should say, um, this is Benjamin Rush, who was a big proponent of moderating alcohol or abolishing it. And um, temperance began to rise in tandem with the heavy drinking of the, yeah, the heavy drinking of those who lived here and founded the country. So um, that's my presentation for now. I, this is a really sweet sort of depiction of a, the inside of a, a pub, public house. And that's the book. And that's me, if you'd like to follow on Instagram. And that's my email. If you'd like to email some questions to me or comments, I would love them. Um, that the time really went quickly for me. So thank you for listening. I can't tell. I'm very curious if people like seeing the slides on Zoom or if they like seeing people. But that's how it went today. Live and learn, Corinne. I, I thought that went fine. And um, I'll make sure to include your email in the in, in the email that I send tomorrow with the feedback survey. Um, yeah. So Corinne, did you want to take additional questions now or did you want to talk kind of briefly about uh, uh, sort of the industry at the moment? Yeah, I um, I will take, I can do both. So there's someone asked for my email. Here it is. Well, it's my name at mac.com. And you can also DM me on uh, Instagram. People, I communicate a lot with people that way uh, now. And so, yes, you have any, do you have any, know any, any places locally that offer some of the old colonial drinks? If you want to email me, I could, I could probably put together a few names for you in your area. When I was doing research for this book, it was a while ago now, it was like five or six years ago, I was finding places that had flipped in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, there are a few places that have revived them. I mean, you go to, uh, in New York, there's Francis Tavern, which I think is closed at this point, but they had some drinks on their menu. Good local spruce beer. There is a brewery in New Hampshire that does spruce beer, and I see that, but it's seasonal. It doesn't, they don't always have it. it, it and again, please email me and I'll, I'll find the name for you. <laughs> I guess my, my brain is resting on the detail of just, just spruce beer, but there are a few places in New England that do it. Mead is made in Ipswich. That's great. Yeah, there's a bunch of mead makers in Vermont at this now that have, um, mead's become really popular in the last few years. Sparkling mead, if you have not had it, delicious. I'm not such a mead, I, mead doesn't really, um, I'm not that into it, but sparkling mead, I love. I tend to prefer drier drinks. Mead production was quite big in, in New Jersey, as was, I didn't mention Applejack, which was sort of the very alcoholic component, uh, twin to apple cider or to hard cider. Apple Jack, again, New Jersey was a pro center of production for Apple Jack. And that was another colonial era beverage. And is there a difference between a public house and a stagecoach stop? There is, um, stagecoach stops seem to be more inns where you could get a bed. I mean, the bed sounded rough. It sounded like they were made of straw. Sometimes there's vermin and whatnot, but it seemed like you could sleep more, of course, in those places, and they'd more generally, dependably, have food of varying qualities. Whereas a public house probably wouldn't wouldn't all the time have food, and and that was the main difference that I could tell. Oh yeah, Laird's Applejack still does a raging business in New Jersey for sure. Um, so right before, oh, thank you for the link to the meadery. Do I know of any cookbooks of this period? Did I use any cookbooks? I did not use cookbooks. The first American cookbook was the late 1700s by Amelia Simmons. And um, there weren't, there were some English cookbooks around at that time. There might be some in my bibliography, but I don't recall relying on them primarily at all. Um, there are some great books that came out in the 1800s um, that outline old drink recipes. Um, so right, right before we went live, Robert and I were talking about um, been tough covering restaurants right now, and he mentioned that Massachusetts is going back into phase one. I think you, you said, or the entire state is 
undergoing. No, it's um, not that diary years. yet, but yeah, uh, it's uh, fa it's I don't want I want to get this right. It's step one of phase three. It's a long, complicated story. It's yeah. A okay. <laughs> step one of oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, we're we're dialing uh, things are being dialed back here, but I've been covering restaurants all um, all year here in Long Island and, and following along in other parts of the country. Um, and it's been it's been a challenging time, um, as you all know, especially for restaurant tours. And I I just wanted to mention that in case anyone had any questions. I I'm always curious as to how it is elsewhere. But when people have been, sorry, I should have put this on silent. People have become very restaurant owners and operators have become extremely creative. They amaze me all the time with the things that they're doing to survive. But of course, there are some who just didn't open up after the first reopen after the first. Uh, stay at home order. We have a lot of greenhouses and igloos, like individual outdoor structures going up next to restaurants here um, with heating elements in them often. There's a lot of gas lamps appearing everywhere. everywhere. I think that restaurant owners are hoping to kind of make, to draw people um, with outdoor seating and lots of heat and fire pits and whatnot. Um, and of course, everyone has different comfort levels on whether they want to go out and expose themselves or not, or whether it's you know, there are just so many different, people have so many different thoughts um, and comfort levels, but it was definitely, you'd think that all of that coverage, everything we wrote about reviews and whatnot would go away, but there's just been a whole nother range of things to write about this year. Um, and that's where I've been at. And I used to write a drinks column for Newsday. Um, um, I don't do it anymore. The people are more interested in reading about food here than drinks. They love the drinks coverage. But not every week. I was doing something every week, and um, food is definitely a much more popular subject for people to read about here. In Vermont, it was a bit different. People loved reading about beverages of all sorts. Um, yeah. So thank. Oh, I see. Earth Eagle Brewing in Portsmouth. I have been there. Oh, Bruce Bruce Beer. Oh, that's a great tip. That place is great. I love it. Um, did they have any hot chocolate? and Bailey's drinking cocoa so it was a thing towards the late 1700s as coffee was on the rise as well but I think cocoa was again quite dear on chocolate it wasn't something that every household would have but did have it I don't think Bailey's is that old that could be wrong um and where public houses converted from residential houses or were they built for that purpose I think it's both you know I think in a lot of instances they were constructed for that specific purpose but the person who ran it might live there, so they might do dual, dual duty, um, and then some were converted, and then some were built as public houses and then reverted to houses. And it's fascinating to me that you could drive through New England and see there's all these houses around you that used to be public houses because there were so many of them. And some towns would have so many more than, you know, than they really needed for the number of people that were there. Um, and. I think I've gotten everything so far, but if I missed your question, please do email me. Um, and the definition of public house. Um, a public house would be a house, uh, a tavern open to the public, a place uh, where beverages were served, where alcoholic beverages were served, highly regulated, open to the public. And that term, I, I believe, came over from England because it's still the, the most prevalent term for uh, pubs there, it's public house. So open it to only a tavern, not a hotel. I believe if there were places, if there were rooms to stay there, there might've been informal rooms, but it seemed like if there were beds, it would be called an inn, the public house. Um, but it seemed that in the, in the record, if you, meant, if you said inn, it was a place that had spots to sleep in, whereas a public house did not. So, and public houses were called ordinaries before they were called public house, but I didn't mention that term because it, it, there's really no clear reason. Uh, people say it, it's derived from ordinaire, the French word ordinaire, um, and there's a number of theories as to why ordinary was the prevalent term, but you would have, in the 1600s, public houses were called ordinaries. So, so uh, Corinne, we're coming up on eight o'clock. Uh, I want to thank you. You crammed a lot of information into <laughs> so. our presentation, and I think you answered over a dozen questions. So phenomenal job there. And let's end on this. Um, where can uh, folks uh, learn more about you and where can they purchase a copy of your book? Oh, so, um, you know, I would love to say go to my website, but I don't have one and I haven't had
have one. But I actually think I'm thinking of putting one up fairly soon. But you can email me for a copy of my book. I could, or you can get ask your local bookseller. Of course, there's Amazon, but I always encourage independent. You go to independent booksellers. Uh, I don't know if there might be one in the library there, or there's some libraries that have them. So if you want to email me, then we can work it out, and I can sign a copy and send it to you. Yeah, and, I'm ashamed. And, um, I'm ashamed if, you Google, if you Google me, you'll find more about me. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, and we'll follow you on Instagram. And I'm ashamed to say we do not currently own your book, but I'm going to okay. rectify this and we will own it <laughs> very soon. Right. So I um, yeah. want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Look for that email tomorrow with the feedback survey. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. So thanks again. Thank yes. you so much, Corinne. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good one. <laughs>